God bless the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Please be seated, ladies and gentlemen. All right, today we have lined up a series of activities and of course, keynote speaker of good justice to the theme for this edition of the Inventional Series. Right after that, we have a panel discussion. This opportunity to listen to Africans as they tell the story of how technology is being tried at first day narrative. At this point, we'd like to commit this event to the hands of the Almighty God. And to help us do that, I'd like to invite the senior pastor of the Living Spring Baptist Church, Amor Rofi. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Reverend Matthew Shiambadi. It is Uncle Sam. My colleagues from the industry, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it is with great pleasure that I welcome you to the sixth edition of the Innovation Series, themed How Technology is Driving Africa's New Narrative. As you do well know, internet penetration in Africa has been gathering momentum over the last half decade as we seek to close the gap on ICT with Western climbs. And with all these trends, Nigeria leads the continent and is expected to be among the top 10 internet using countries in the world by 2018. In recent years, a lot of African countries have embraced technology as a driver of development. According to statistics updated in June 2015, Africa has 28.6% internet penetration, with Nigeria having 11.3% of the total penetration in Africa. What this shows is that Nigeria is a big player in the African market. Africa is moving gradually from a resource-based economy to knowledge-based, innovation-driven economy. This has helped in impacting our youth as more of them 
above average, have above average uh, um, exposure to the internet, sharing ideas, sharing content, and commercial opportunities seamlessly across the globe. These giant strides have opened regardless of red tape bureaucracy that typifies governance across the continent. Amidst these giant strides in technology, there still remains a large demographic of young people, mostly women, who remain in rural and semi-urban areas below the poverty line and seem unable to tap into this new and emerging economy. The Innovation Series will attempt to provide pragmatic ways of helping Africa's young, yet vulnerable population gain the requisite skills to lift themselves out of poverty and, pro and participate in the global economy now detected by technology. Small and medium enterprises who are also key to Africa's growth also need to efficiently harness the power of technology to make a quantum leap so they can contribute to helping Africa develop on a continental scale. On our part, our resolve remains strong in pursuing platforms and opening up opportunities to further the discourse and ventilations that deepen the quest for this new economy. Going forward, it is our intention to take on the road around the country, around Nigeria, the Innovation Roundtable, which is the bite-sized version of the Innovation Series. Through this, we will hopefully gain focus on germane issues in the different localities, as well as attempt organic solutions that will endure. As we institutionalize the structures around the series, there's also the necessity to take the conversations abroad, particularly along the west coast of Africa in the first instance. What is clear to us now is that the series has become something of a public trust, which explains in part the robust support we have enjoyed from our partners. We remain appreciative to them all. And to our distinguished panel, Joel, uh, Maya, Afwa, I think she's on her way, Timmy, Mwiwa Charles, Moski Moyela. We salute your erudition and groundbreaking commitment to the African project through your individual endeavors. Ladies and gentlemen, I commend this edition of the Innovation Service to you all. You are most welcome. Thank you. And of course, ladies and gentlemen, those were words well spoken. Interestingly, I made a mental note of a particular statement. And of course, he said, Africa is gradually moving from a resource-based economy to a knowledge-based and innovation-driven economy. And, and of course, that is the truth. Resources will definitely dry up. It's been estimated that oil, which Nigeria rarely depends on, will be exhausted in the next 50 years or so. And of course, we must indeed make that move to being a knowledge-based and innovation-driven economy. Ladies and gentlemen, that was the affable and avuncular TJ, as he likes to be called. <laughs> Please, a round of applause for the Executive Vice Chairman of the Veteran Field Group, Dr. Tsunji Ulugodi, for those words. Thank you very much, sir, for those words. All right, up next we have a sales manager and content management strategist, Fikun Ade Adeniji. Round of applause for Fikun Ade Adeniji as he steps up. Have a short presentation from him. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Well, I must say that you guys look amazing this morning. Can you put your hands together for yourselves, please, real quick? All right, so um, I am here on behalf of CISL Africa and Veterans of Marketing Communications Group to present to you one of our babies, a baby that we all are proud, extremely proud of. Um, myhomepage.ng is a website aggregator for your favorite news, gossips, and politics, entertainment, and lifestyle. It is available on both mobile devices and on your desktop. 
And everyone is there, really. Um, Vanguard, Linda Ikeji, um, Bella Niger, you name it. Any news that you're looking for, it, it saves you time and it saves you tabs. So when you go to the website, every, you don't even need to scroll down. Everything is right on the homepage, the most important news, what's trending as it comes day by day, hour by hour, minute by minute. And um, so you want to know where I get what's trending? News, politics, fashion, gossips, it's all on. for it. My homepage.ng. Thank you very much. And of course, we didn't just announce that so that you'd forget it. The idea is check the site, get to have an idea of what exactly is on display every now and then. My homepage.ng. Don't forget, that's the right address. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for us to have the keynote presentation. Remember, we're looking at how technology is driving Africa's new narrative. And of course, our keynote speaker is ready and raring to go. Remember, the hashtag is Innovation Drives Africa. If you have a picture, a comment, any feedback at all ready, the hashtag to use is Innovation Drives Africa. So join the conversation on social media. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for us to have the keynote address and of course, our speaker is ready and raring to go. It gives me great joy and honor to welcome our keynote speaker for the sixth edition of the Intervention Series with the theme, How Technology is Driving Africa's New Narrative. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome with me our keynote speaker, the founder, JC Capital, South Africa, Joel Chimahanda. A round of applause, please. to everybody. Uh, I just want to thank Dr. Tunde, who is a good friend of mine for, I was introduced to him by my godfather, Bode Adediji, about three years ago. Um, I had a presentation which I prepared for today, and technology, they say something can go wrong, it will go wrong. So something went wrong. So I've written a new presentation, so I'm going to go through that just now. The three most important things in my life is an African life that's worth living. I have studied the American dream and I came to the conclusion that I wanted no part of the American dream because it's a system that has run for three, four hundred years and is failing today. So when Mr. Tunji asked me to speak, what I decided to do was I decided to give five African case studies, our technology has changed the continent. So I want us to agree, because I only have 30 minutes to speak, and somebody's helping me after every five or 10 minutes to make sure that I don't exceed my time. But I believe all the five case studies will be good, because what I don't want to do is to give theory about technology and how it will change our lives I want to talk about what's already done. And then I'm going to share a little bit some things that I'm going to do with Tunji, uh, the Dan Zil, with the Africa Union. The information I'm going to talk about is not what I heard. I'm talking about facts. Let me start with politics. Now, if you look at the world, the world has got the United Nations. The United Nations has 280 member states. The world has got the World Bank. And there's something called Bretton Wood Institutions. And there is the Europe Investment Bank. The world has got what's called G4. 
G4 are the economies in the world who determine whether we live or die, whether the nuclear bomb is plugged or not. They've got somebody who they bring as an unwanted cousin to make the fifth nation that rotates. G4 has got its locus, which is the balance sheet. It's called World Economic Forum. World Economic Forum was put together by a guy called Bloomberg. Michael Bloomberg was the mayor of New York and he runs a company, Bloomberg. And there's Charles Schwab. What this global world has done is they've placed an order from the world. They've got World Economic Forum Africa. They've got World Economic Forum Asia. They have World Economic Forum South America. They have World Economic Forum uh, Asia Pacific. Then, all this World Economic Forum, there is something called G4, G7, 8, G20. G20, there's something they call BRICS. Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. Now, the world is so organized at coming and continuing the colonialism that they have been running for the past 200 years. And they are, they are calling it something sophisticated. And Africa goes every time to World Economic Forum Africa to participate in continued being taken advantage of. Now, I'm going to bring this back home. In Africa, there is the Africa Union. That's 54 African member states. In Africa, there is Africa Development Bank. This is the development bank that is supposed to help develop infrastructure. Africa Development Bank is owned and controlled by foreign institutions. Its balance sheet and capitalization is not African. There is Afri Exim Bank. Afri Exim Bank, again, is supposed to improve intra-Africa trade. Now, Africa Development Bank if you do not put infrastructure, that's called industrialization, infrastructure is road, it's port, it's harbor, it's rail, it's airport, it's bus system. If more than X percent of what you spend is higher than your competing partner, you can't compete. Now, Africa Development Bank requires one hundred billion dollars to put the power necessary, it requires three hundred billion dollars to put the rail network to fix Africa, it requires four hundred billion dollars if the mines that need to be operationalized in the continent, it requires, we need more than one trillion US dollars for us to have the right roads, ports, harbors to be able to function. I'm talking about innovation. Now, the way Africa was colonized historically is that of every $100 everybody in this room spends every day, you spend more than $90 on money that goes outside of Africa. The tie you're wearing, the shoes you're wearing, the iPhone that you carry, the Etisalat, Glow, Airtel, MTN, 90 cents of every 100 cents that you spend every day goes outside of Africa. Intra-Africa trade is 11%. Now, when you look at the Jews, I'm going to talk about the Jews, then I'm going to talk about the Asians, then I'm going to talk about the Africaners, then I'm going to talk about the Africans. In the Jewish community, this is research done. It's Dr. Claude Anderson. I was going to give you the thing, the, the pitch. You can go and take a look at it. A Jewish person will spend their money in a Jewish community, the shirt, the grocery, the bank, the uh, airline ticket. It bounces in their community 18 to 21 times before it goes outside. If you look at the Asians, the money bounces 15 to 18 times in their community before it goes outside. So an Asian person will order something simpler from India, then they will use an Indian company to do the software, then they will use the India Export Finance Bank, 
Then in, start, in Africa, they will use an Indian private equity firm that invested in a Nigerian bank, and that bank is controlled by the Indians, whether it's Apal, Randawa, whatever. Eight, 15 to 18 times, the money goes back into their system. If you go to the Africaners, when they were colonized South Africans, the Africaners learned and they replicated the Jewish model. There is about 20 South Africans, Africaners, that control the South Africa economy. They are called the Stellenbosch boys. Christo Wiese, Laurie Dipena, Yako Marie, I can give you the names. Those five, 20 guys, if they met and they said we're doing something, it'll happen. If they met and they said it's not gonna happen, it's not gonna happen. 20 people in South Africa. This is the magazine that shows the richest of Africa. The 20 people I'm talking about, they are listed in here. When you go to G4, there's eight people or families in the world. They are more valuable, they have more money than 50% or the rest of the world put together. 50% of the world, there's 8 billion people, so 4 billion people, including us, Nigeria, uh, China, and everybody. There's 8 people in America, and Europe, and France, and, and uh, China. If they sat in a room and they decided what they were going to do, it will happen. They control 50% of the GDP of the world, 8 people. Now, when we talk about innovation, data, whatever, all those models are servicing the first world. So I've done my background brief. United Nations is politics. Africa Union is politics. World Bank is development finance. They put roads, telecommunications, infrastructure, etc. Do you think the World Bank will come and put an oil refinery in Nigeria to pull just a million tons of fuel a day? Or do you think that they will want Nigeria crude oil to go out at $40 and come back at $100 fuel products? Which companies, which companies in the world produce fuel? Chevron, Total. Why is Apple for iPhone manufactured in China? Why? Why is nothing manufactured in Africa? When it comes to Africa, they tell us that we are corrupt. When they are sitting in America, there is the Democrats and the Republicans. The Republicans, George Bush, Jeb Bush, John Walker Bush, and their father, five generation, 100 years, the Bush family has controlled the American economy and they call it democracy. How is it possible that from the same great-great-grandfather, three children have become American presidents? How is it possible that Bill Clinton and his wife, they tell us we are corrupt and they call it lobby? They tell us we, are, we don't think and yet, James Mwangi set up equity bank that Standard Bank and Citibank cannot compete with. They tell us we don't know what we're doing. Micah Denuga and Eti Salat, they've created mobile companies. Micah Denuga is listed in the, in the rich of the rich. There's nothing wrong with us as Africans. We have mental slavery. We want the white people. We want to sit under them. We want to obey them. When we see a black person, we don't want to discuss with them. Why would an African head of state agree to give up $100 billion of platinum resource or oil to a foreign company in exchange for $100 million put in his private bank account? How is it possible? And that private bank account sits in Switzerland. And that private bank account, nobody knows it exists. And when the Africa heads of state dies, after 15 years, the billions that have gone out in all these deals, they naturalize in Switzerland. How come on 9-11, 3,500 Americans died on the Twin Towers? 
America declared war on the world. In six months, America was able to determine the Bin Laden family was worth $560 million. They put Know Your Customer. They put FICA. Six months. And they froze their assets. And then they started a war in the Middle East. Libya is dead. Egypt is dead. Iran is dead. Morocco is dead. And we Africans participate in supporting a cancer that destroys our economy. The time has come for Africans to think as Africans. Kwame Nkrumah, Patrice Lumumba, Nelson Mandela, Alfred Rewani. We have African thinkers. This Africa Union, Africa currency was thought about more than 60 years ago. This NIPAD is thought about 60 years ago. How, many, how much time do I have? I'll, I need to go to the thing. Okay. I'm giving you a context because when I talk and I'm going to cut to the chase, you're going to get it. Okay? You're going to get it. I'm not going to give you a lecture. I'm not going to give you something and you say you spoke good English. I'm an African. I know what I'm talking about. And there's something that I'm doing, which we're doing with the Africa Union. We've signed an MOU with the Africa Forum. We are presenting at the Africa 54 heads of state. We've got 12 projects and we've chosen 10 billionaires. Aliko Dangote is, we've asked him to chair that because he's the father of industrialization. You can't do anything in Africa without Aliko Dangote because Aliko Dangote has been able to crack it. I'm not going to worry somebody says Aliko got this contract from this one. No, there was this thing. I don't care. What, talk to me about George Bush. Do you know how much money they make security in the people that are killed in the Middle East? You know how much money George, how much money um, Bill Clinton makes the Bill Clinton Foundation. You know how much money they took to Malawi to give to the Malawi president if they were going to say that they can have lesbians and whatever. I'm talking things I've heard first hand. The person flies in, comes out because they don't agree to sign. So what I'm talking about, I'm not talking about what I heard or something that I heard that was said by other people that heard from another person. Everything I'm saying here Present tense. I've sat in front and I've listened to President Obasanja talking. I've sat in front of President Mbeke talking. I've sat in front of Robert Mugabe talking. I've sat in front of your deputy Osibajo talking. I've sat in front of Jacob Zuma talking. I've sat in, I'm not, not in front, three meters, listening, having a conversation. I've sat in front of them because I advise billionaires that are bringing money and when they come with a deal, I'm the guy that comes to talk. So because I'm there, they talk to me as an African. So we want technology. Let me talk to you about Silicon Valley. Let's go to technology. What is Silicon Valley anyway? Silicon Valley is a place that a number of people have put three trillion US dollars, five trillion US dollars, I don't know, that says, Anyone that comes with an idea, and if the idea makes sense, we're going to support it. When we support it, we're going to own 50% of the company. We're going to try 50 ideas. If the 50 ideas are tried, we only need 10 ideas that come right. The other 40 ideas go to death. So if we put 1 trillion into ideas, and if 400 million produces Facebook, produces Pinterest, produces Google, produces Skype produces WhatsApp. This four, $600 billion that's lost, it doesn't matter because those four companies are worth $10 trillion. It has to be thought by somebody somewhere and they have to take a view. Now, how does Africa, if we talk about banking, somebody says, let's talk about banking. What is it about banking? Banking is about three things. The first thing is a switch. The second thing is about regulation. The third thing is about customer. So the switch is postillion of overseas. All the Nigerian banks, they are using postillion. And it's called interswitch. 
In South Africa, they are using SASwitch and its postillion. In Zimbabwe, they use ZimSwitch and its postillion. The same guy that gives postillion to all the African continents, and postillion costs 150 million rands a year. before you start doing anything else, to just open the door, to say, I have postillion. And yet in Nigeria, there's a company called eTransact. Do you know it? eTransact, Valentine has a switch that's better than postillion. Valentine has value-added services that are better than Gemalto. Do you know a company called Gemalto? Those of you that know banking, Gemalto is the gorilla in printing cards, or Aubergine. Uh, and yet, Je Valentine cannot run a business in South Africa. It's dominated. It's a cartel. Standard Bank, FNB, Barclays, Ned Bank, whatever. Can't move. And yet, Nigerian banks are not working with Valentine in Nigeria to bank the unbanked. Okay, let's leave everybody who has his banking business. Let's not temper with them. This government wants to give 5,000 Naira a month. Is the government trying to give a social grant of 5,000 Naira a month? Does that need to go through a postillion switch that costs an arm and a leg? No. You just need a switch. Who should own the switch? The government, central bank. How much is the switch? 20% of postillion. Does the woman in Kanu, in Port Harcourt, in Enugu, in Ogun, require an EMV compliant card? No. That's for international banking. Why are we going through a postillion switch to deliver 5,000 Naira, when 5,000 Naira reaches my grandmother in Kanu, it's 2,700 Naira. Because the bank and the switch and everything and the bus and the taxi to arrive at the venue has cost another 2,000 Naira. Why doesn't the government own their switch? The government of Nigeria can own a switch to pay all its salaries. The government of Nigeria can own a switch that is no EMV compliant, that does not need know your customer, nor do we care who Visa or MasterCard or Mistress Card is. We create something that's African, and the African issue addresses an African challenge. Now, let me come back to my brother, to my brother, brother Oluk Oluk body. Let's talk media. The company that's the most successful media business is called Africa Business. If I came to 10 of the richest industrialists in Africa and I say to them, do you want to read Forbes? Or do you want to read The African? Or do you want to read The New African? Or do you want to read The Africa Report? Guess what the statistics will do? I'm going to run that thing with, with, with uh, uh, Tunji. We're going to do this, and we're going to show you. It's already been done by a guy called Tebe Ikafeleng. Go and check out the, web, the website, Brand Africa. Brand Africa. Brand Africa. He's done the report for the past five years. Nigerian brands are in the top 50 when you look at spend per capita in Africa. Why? Because UBA, because Eat Eti Salat, because uh, Dangote. Why? Nigeria has 180 million people. Whenever you count four people in Africa, one, two, three, the fourth one is a Nigerian. Five, six, seven, the eighth one is a Nigerian. Nine, ten, eleven, the eleventh one is a Nigerian. Why doesn't Nigeria lead Africa? You people have 200 million people. There's 800 million people in the continent. You can't lead Africa if you guys don't agree. You can't lead Africa if it takes three hours to move from the island at Victoria Island to go and board a flight at your airport. You can't. You can't. It's not possible because you haven't fixed your home. South Africa, people say that South Africa is corrupt. It's the only African country after independence. South Africa was independent in 1994. It's 2014. It's the only African country where the new leadership have invested or reinvested into the economy. Check out how many kilometers of road done by 
Mandela, Mbeki, Zuma, since independence. Check out how many new houses have been built. Forget ANC, DA, forget all they are corrupt, forget Nkandla. Nkandla is $260 million, right? Runs. Let me talk about Nkandla. It's in the paper every day. Nkandla, Nkandla, Zuma is corrupt. There's a report that has come out. Standard Bank, Investec, and APSA. They've transfer priced 70 billion rands out of South Africa in the last 10 years. Let me give you another statistic. Brian Molefe was the CEO of ESCOM. He's a black guy. He did a deal which he allowed a black company, the Guptas, 800 million rands to do coal takeout. He resigned and he left because he realized that it was indefensible. Nothing done wrong. Then there is a report. Four Africans' families, four, not ten, four Africans' families, they have taken out 20 billion runs out of ESCOM in the last 10 years. We are talking about 800 million because somebody is not liked because they are to do with Zuma. And yet there is 20 billion runs taken out by four families that don't even live in South Africa. Nobody talks about that. Why? Media. The media is biased. The media is biased. Now, this is how the world works. How many people know Bob Marley? And how many people think Bob Marley was a good guy? Okay, how many people know Michael Jackson? And how many people think Michael Jackson was a good guy? That guy called Michael Jackson, he created something that had never been done before. This thing called pop music, Beyonce, Jay-Z, VZ, TZ, whatever they are called. <laughs> it's a creation of a little guy called Michael Jackson. It's a creation of a little guy called Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson was a genius. He sat in his room and he created something that nobody else had done. And then he presented it and it was packaged. And people laughed at it in 1980, off the wall. They laughed at it in 1985, beat it. They laughed at it in 1988. And then when he did Thriller, and then the whole world listened. And then he became number one, not once, not twice, continually until no one else could be number one. Every single person in the music industry that has become anything they take a chip from Michael Jackson. Jay-Z is Michael Jackson. Beyonce, the way they dance, the way they move, the way they act, the way they do whatever. They are all Michael Jackson. So if Adenuga has got Glossel or Eti Salata, I can't remember. If Dangote has got Dangote cement, let me tell you something about cement. Dangote, if you, if you guys think he's rich, he hasn't even started. Dangote is in an industry called cement and aggregation. In Africa, Nigeria, a Nigerian uses 108 kgs of, of cement to produce their house, their port, their harbor. In China, China, one Chinese, 1 1.4 billion, they use 518 kgs of cement to produce their house, their road, whatever. In Ghana, 123 kgs. In South Africa, 300 kgs. In Nigeria, 108 kgs. Nigeria will move to 500 kgs. So if Dangote is worth 12 billion at 100 kgs, multiply by five, Dangote will be worth anything between 70 and 100 billion dollars in the next five to 10 years. It'll happen because he's in an industry where if Africa wants to fix the problem, we have to have the cement. And the biggest cement companies in the world is Holchim. Then there is the German. Then the third one is Aliko Dangote. He is now the third largest cement producer, not in Africa, in the world. In the world. It's called critical mass. And it's called competitive advantage. Now, when Aliko Dangote is raising his funding, why is he paying 5 or 10% advisory fees to Goldman Sachs? When Tony Olimel is there, when what's FBC is there, 
when Ifiese Kibo Heritage Bank is there, the same structure that raises the money and brings the money is called syndication. When you are funding something for $100 billion, it requires something called distribution in our world. I'm an investment banking. Okay? In investment banking, there is the retail banking. Then there is the commercial banking. Then there is the corporate banking. And then there is the advisory, treasury alcohol. And then there is investment banking. And in investment banking, there is private equity, there is venture capital, and there is corporate finance. The cream of banking is called corporate finance, M&A, mergers and acquisition. These are the open heart surgery guys in banking. Every single deal done by Africa and Africa Development Bank, the investment bankers are from Rothschild, from Deutsche Bank, from JP Morgan, from whatever. Do you think they'll structure a deal that will leave money in Africa? It can't happen. Why do these African heads of state, when they are raising money to do a project, give an advisor, some white guy that comes wandering around as if the guy knows? These are the rejects from the first world. The real guys in the first world is Paul. They are the guys that become the tre secretary of the treasury. And yet we have Africans that know, that know, that know. Stan Bick has been here for 20, since 1988. I was the head of investment banking in Zimbabwe, moved to South Africa, head of investment banking in South Africa for two years. Then I was made head of investment banking for 18 countries on the continent. I was here when we tried to buy UBA, we tried to buy EcoBank, we tried to buy IBTC, 1999. Arnold Ekpe, Tony Lumeli, and what's his name, the gentleman that owns IBTC. We were offered those banks for 60 to 100 million dollars for 40 to 70 percent equity. And then MTN came and they spent 280 million dollars on a license. And the MTN share in South Africa dropped 60 percent, knock. And the directors in Standard Bank says, we can't invest in Nigeria, dangerous country. Three years later, this is 2001, they had to put 200 million dollars new capital adequacy. You used to have 95 banks. They were reduced to 25. Six years later, they came back in and bought IBTC, this time big IBTC. They paid $600 million plus $200 million capitalization, $800 million. How do you pay $800 million for something that you could have paid $100 million for 60%? Because you don't have the right local partner that advises you. So innovation has nothing to do with innovation. Innovation has something to do with finding a solution for a local problem. Now, if we want to go and compete in the banking world and compete with Goldman Sachs, good luck. If we say, Mr. Tunji, closing remark. If we say our customer is the African that lives on less than $1 a day, that's our customer. Let's run this market research. Let's partner with someone in Kenya, South Africa, Nigeria, Egypt, Ethiopia, and Kenya. Somebody says, why those countries? Those are the economies that run. Nigeria runs ECOWAS. South Africa runs SADAC. Kenya runs East Africa Community. You can say Nigeria or Algeria or Morocco or Egypt. Morocco is not part of the that's Maghreb region. And then you have a little company called DRC and Angola. They are no man's land, but these economies can be bigger than South Africa in the next 10 years. And then you have a country, a, a country called Zimbabwe and a country called Zambia. That's the center of commerce. So, so what are you talking about Robert Mugabe? No, I'm not talking about Robert Mugabe. I'm talking about IP. There is something called literacy. That's the read and write. There's something called numeracy. That's the ability to read one plus one is two. There's something called education. That's the ability to have a degree in, in science, in economics, in whatever. Then there is something called skills development. 80% of the things you read at university, you don't use in your job today. Can we agree? 80%. 80% of the things you read in grade seven to go to high school, you never used in Form 1, correct? 
80% of the things that you finished when you got your NSA, you never used in your job, correct? So what do we need? A different education system. You do not need three years to learn. The industry that proves you can learn in six months is IT. You can become a Microsoft engineer in six months and you can earn 50,000 rands a month in South Africa. You can become an SAP project manager and you can earn 100,000 rands a month in South Africa in one year. You can become a data, analytic, whatever, social media and earn 100,000 rands a month in South Africa. No degree, nothing, no degree. Now, who will find the solution for the little lady living in Onuru whose son is a PhD working at the World Bank, who sends $1,000 a month to his grandmother, of which Western Union takes $150 every month and she receives $950, of which EcoBank takes $100 for taking it to her, of which she then takes a bus and a taxi, $600. We are participating in an immoral exercise. Instead of creating a switch in Africa, that aggregates 200 million Africans that live on less than a dollar a day. So guys, when we talk technology, it has nothing to do with technology. It has something to do solving a problem. So for me, the problem, our project, there's Naira 5,000 runs, which I know will be given to some poor people. I want to work with InterSwitch or with eTransact, or I will find the company that will work with us to put a switch and to do a proposal to do the market research and go and present it. You will no longer be a branding company where you ask for people to sponsor your company and you're in the back of the queue and they say, who are you? You are creating the future. Anybody who runs a technology company or branding company can't be poor. It's not possible. And the brand is Brand Africa. And the brand is Ubuntu. And the brand is we wake up one morning where people sitting in France they wonder, how do we get a green visa for Nigeria? The people are sitting in China, in China, and when they wake up, they wonder, how will I be able to go and live in Harare? If we can't fix our problems and we have the education, your Minister of Finance ran the World Bank, Ntuli Nube, one of the finest minds in economics in Zimbabwe, was running this business school, he became the group economist for Africa Development Bank. He is now at Oxford. One of the best economic minds in this country, his name is Doin Salami. I don't know if you people know him. Doin Salami. He's a little guy, gray hair. Nobody listens to him. He told me, Joel, the exchange rate is going to move from 190. It will go to 250. If they don't do one, two, three, Joel, the exchange rate will hit 400. And he says, Joel, once it goes beyond 350, it's a psychological thing. All the Nigerians that have money will take their money out. What happens at Independent when, when the government was changing from, Buhari, from good luck to Buhari? Where the airport's not jammed, you couldn't get on an airplane to come out that weekend. And people were waiting to see what's going to happen. Okay, you've spent nine months trying to find out what happened to $20 billion PPC and $400 million which was sitting in the Minister of Oil's account but you know what has happened? You've wiped out $300 billion of the Nigeria economy when the rate moved from 200 to 400, 500. Does 20 billion compare with that? Do an amnesty. Tell these people you stole the money we know. If you come and you give, the Bible said, I'll go and give back four times what I stole. <laughs> it's amnesty. It's amnesty. You can have amnesty. Why did Robert Mugabe forgive Peter Walls and Ian Smith? Ian Smith lived in Zimbabwe, writing every day, saying whatever he wanted to say to Robert Mugabe every day because he was forgiven. Amnesty. Once you sign amnesty, you can't go back. Tell the people, anybody who took the money out, we're giving you six months, declare what you took out, we will give you 50% back, but we need to know the truth. If you haven't done so in six months, we will now go and look for you. If we look for you, we're going to put you in jail. Nigeria will have more than $1 trillion come back. It's there. It's there. It's outside. They have it. But they don't want to go to jail. You can't tell them you're going to go to jail because Nelson Mandela forgave the clerk. Chris Honey was killed by these Africans. 
Chris Honey is like an Africa liberation hero. And yet they forgave him. The idiot that killed Chris Honey was in jail for the past 15 years. And now he wanted to be pardoned because he had been a good prisoner, drank his food, went everywhere, killed Chris Honey, our leader. How can a person that killed our leader, we accept that they, they, they get away with it? Why can't we forgive a Nigerian who took money out? He must be forgiven. Let me tell you, there's no innovation that will fix our continent. It's in our hands. And it's in politics. Politics is the land. Land creates the law. The law, which is the police, creates the army, which is war if you don't agree with the law. Then the army then creates government, which is APC. We're all different. I've got four children. We're fixing problems every second month. They don't agree with each other. Married for 30 years. We've seen them every day. Went them to the same school, same car, same house. But whenever they're doing something, they don't agree. So just know that we'll never agree. What happens when you go now to the law? Then you get onto media. Media informs. When you are informed, you make an informed decision. If you are misinformed, you make a misinformed decision. 90% of Africans make misinformed decisions. Closing remark. I was with someone. I was with someone. Someone. So they said to me, what do you think of death penalty? So I said for me, if a person takes a life, I think the life of the person must be taken. What about the person going to jail? I said, there's not even enough money to feed our people $1 a day. It costs $12 a day to keep a person in prison. Did you know that? The one out of prison can't eat $1 a day, one meal. The one in prison, you spend $12 to keep them. So I said, for me, they better, they better die. But, but Joel, you're a Christian. You're a brother. You don't, you don't talk like a, a good person. Do you know what I say to him? I said, if any guy comes in my house and rapes my wife and rapes my daughter or rapes my neighbors or rapes my children or steals from them, I will go and I'll buy a gun and then I'll come. I will shoot them and empty the blanks six. I will reload it and shoot them and empty another six. And then I'll go to the police station and then I'll tell them I've killed him because he raped my wife. What are you supposed to do? If they say to me, you're going to go to jail for 100 years, I said, I'll gladly go to jail for 100 years after I've shot the person that you cannot violate my, my life. I would rather be in jail than live with a raped wife or daughter. Why are our heads of state okay for their citizens, us, to be begging? That's the question I don't understand. I will go to jail for killing the person that tries to rape my wife. And then I'll tell my wife, I'll be seeing you once every month. If my wife decides she's gonna marry Andrew or Peter, I'm okay in jail. She knows I died for her. So innovation is Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley of every 100 professors in America Ivy League schools, 70 of them are not Americans. Harvard, Stanford, INSEAD, MIT, they are all, they are Jews, Indians, Africans, Iranians, all the American Ivy League school, there's no Americans, they don't go to school, they don't read, they can't write. So if we create something where we get Noam Chomsky, does anybody know Noam Chomsky? Top guy. We get those guys and bring them here and he's paid $1 million at Harvard, we pay him $2 million for two years. We get the next guy, he's paid $3 million at, at MIT, we pay him $4 million. We get the next guy in energy power, Nobel Peace Prize, he gets paid $1 million, we give him $4 million. We bring those guys, Aliko Dangote, Patrice Motepe, Adenuga, we have $100 million and we have Africa Leadership Academy. We get them to come and work with 30 young Africans, first class, cum laude, engineering, accounting law, to start thinking and solving this problem. And then in 12 months, 18 months, we've now spent 30 million times three years, $100 million. We've spent $100 million and we now have a thousand young Africans 
in technology, in communications, in banking, with the best of the best of the best in the world. They will then come and sit with UBA, with Etisalat, with MTN, with JC Capital, and they will resolve how do we get Mpesa for Nigeria. Not to get Mpesa for Kenya, try to do it in South Africa, it failed. So guys, for me that's technology. So, and if we can't do it with the Africa Union, Agenda 2063, we can't do it. The five people that can get this to happen, I'll give you their names. It's President Buhari. It's President Uhuru Kenyatta. It's President Jacob Zuma. It's the President of Egypt. It's the President of um, East Africa, West Africa. It's whoever the President, the Commissioner for the AU, Zuma has just left. And then it's the President of Africa Development Bank and the president of Afri Exim Bank. If these people go in a room and they say, what are we going to do in ECOWAS, in SADAC, Africa Development Bank funds 18 conferences. The 18 conferences they support by logo, 10 of them are run from Dubai and London. One of them is the mining in Daba. The mining in Daba is the place to discuss mining. I asked your Minister of Mining to come. These white people, sorry if there is white people among us, these international multinational corporations, they bring our cabinet ministers in Cape Town, they bring our presidents, they bring our regulators for one week for them to come and get everything they want in mining sitting in Cape Town. They can't even get on an aeroplane to arrive in Nigeria or Rwanda or Burundi. And we Africans do that to ourselves. Why can't we have a mining in Daba, Nigeria, and everybody comes to Nigeria? Nigeria is saying we want to diversify. We want to diversify. South Africa is a leading mining authority. South Africa is a leading automotive authority. Zimbabwe is a leading mining authority, platinum. Go and check what they do. Zimbabwe is a leading construction aggregation. Greenica, uh, uh, Group 5, Marion Roberts, yeah, it's, it's bankrupt now because there's nothing happening. But the skills are there. I'm a Zimbabwean. I was funding things with Greenica. I was doing things with uh, whatever. I did deals in Zimbabwe when I was 25 and to 28. We did 1,000 houses, low-income housing. We did a project, Pungwe, 100 kilometers water brought from Mozambique into Pungwe and Eastern Highlands. We built a brand new Parkview Hospital. We started a newspaper, Geoff Nyarota. We built Joiner Development, the biggest shopping center in Zimbabwe called Joiner. We got involved. I was then transferred to go to South Africa, and then I was lost in the system. I did these things in Zimbabwe. Not me and 15 other people. I did this. I did this. I can show you the guy I spoke to in London, the guy that I spoke to in Kenya, the MD of Barclays, that we did the deal. $300 million was raised. Standard Bank put $80 million. Barclays put $80 million. We raised $100 million from DFID. We got a guarantee of $60 million from FMO. And then DBSA put $40 million. We then needed $5 million to deal with exchange rate movement. DFID accepted last call of resort, $300 million. We had the deal pipeline. Nobody could fund seven to 15 year money. African countries, every government changes after eight years. So you can't estimate anything that happens after the second term. But this fund knew the projects, and we didn't want to take 100% risk. So Barclays, Africa, Standard Bank, DFID, FMO, we put together the people who have aligned interest. And this fund now, you know how it is. I left. It's $1 billion. This is what this guy is trying to do, Africa Finance Corporation. What's his name? Andrew Ali. He has to be supported. And yet they don't give him the money. And that's the guy that was in IFC. And he's sitting in Nigeria. And he's trying to create a Nigeria business. And people wonder, well, how much is he earning? What car does he drive? I don't care. If, 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 if he become worth $80 million, let him be worth $80 million and let him bring $1 trillion to change the life of 100 million Nigerians that live on less than $1 a day. That's innovation for me. All right, and of course, that citation just came at the right time to wrap up that powerful presentation that was, of course, laced with great depth of insight. And of course, 
was filled with lots of statistics and witty sayings. Ladies and gentlemen, that was our keynote speaker for the sixth edition of the Intervention Series. And of course, he has spoken on how technology is driving Africa's new narrative. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for the founder, JC Capital South Africa, Joel Chimhanda. Thank you very much, sir, for that presentation. All right. And of course, it's time for us to have the panel discussion. First off, I would like to invite our first panelist, who is none other than the founder and chief executive officer of Ingressive. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our first panelist, the founder and chief executive officer, Ingressive, Maya Hogan Famodu. All right, up next, we have the senior vice president, Jabberman. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, please welcome our next panelist, the senior vice president, Jabberman, Olale Kon Olude. A round of applause, please. Our third panelist is none other than the co founder, She Leads Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, please welcome with me our third panelist, the co founder, She Leads Africa, Ifua Ose. And of course, for the final panelist, we have the founder, Life Bank. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, it's an honor for me to welcome the fourth panelist, the founder, Life Bank, Temi Giwa Tumbosno. A round of applause for her, please. I'm not going to be the moderator of this conversation that's about to start, so it's an honor for me to welcome the moderator of this session. And of course, he's none other than the external relations leader, IBM Central and West Africa. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, please make welcome our moderator for this session, the external relations leader, IBM Central and West Africa, Muiwa Muile. All right, and of course, last but not the least, we have the keynote speaker himself, the founder of JC Capital South Africa, Mr. Joel Chimhanda. A round of applause for him as he takes a seat on the platform. And of course, with that, ladies and gentlemen, the panel is complete. And yes, the discussion will start. All right, Mr. Moderator, over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, once again, uh, it's an honor to be here. It's also very refreshing to be amongst uh, JC and uh, our distinguished panelists. Uh, I'm sure we had a very, very uh, good time with JC's presentation. And you know, when he came on board and took off his shirt, took off his jacket, took off his tie, I, I thought he was going to take off his shirt too. Uh, now I understand why he had to take off his jacket and tie, because he was speaking from the heart. And I'm sure we all agree with that. Now, at the end of the day, you know, uh, you, you, you want to talk about little things and big things. And you want to talk about the big picture. Uh, what's the big picture for Africa? What's our own contribution to this journey? Um, he's given us a very good background to how we should be thinking, what is happening, and how Nigeria itself and the various economies should drive Africa. And at the end of the day, it all boils down to one thing. What have we done for ourselves? And what are we going to do? And how much is it going to cost? Um, at the end of the day, also, I think it's also important to situate the conversation across the key sectors. And for me, Africa has several grand challenges. Those challenges are situated in healthcare, in education, in water and waste management, in um, transportation and mobility, in um, energy and power, and also in what you call economic and financial inclusion. My question to all the panelists is a very simple one. Based on Joel's presentation, can you give us starting with Temi, your own mindset on where Africa is. Are we moving forward fast enough? And let me start with Temi. Um, so I work in a sector, a uh, health sector, and um, like uh, the keynote speaker uh, spoke about, there are a lot of um, data points that help me think about the innovation that's needed in the health sector and the future of the health sector in general. Before I came here this morning, I was reading a paper by the International Finance Corporation that says for Nigeria to get its health sector to the basic minimum standard uh, that the rest of the world has, it needs about 4.5 billion 
one-time investments in the health sector. So you need to just take $4.5 billion, push it in your health sector, and that will get you the basic amount of um, services that you will need. Then you need to maintain that with like maybe about $2 billion or $3 billion every year to maintain that same level of um, innovation and efficiency in your health sector. Nigeria currently, at the last budget, we budgeted $1 billion to our health sector. And uh, one of that $1 billion, 60% goes to just paying salaries. So not buying drugs, not buying supplies, not buying equipment, uh, just paying salaries of the people who, who work there. So that, that's an interesting uh, fact. And then um, I also read a report by uh, General Electric that says that um, Africa, for 5,000 Africans, you have one doctor. So one doctor would service 5,000 Africans. And in the rest of the world, in the US, for example, it's one doctor for about 500 people. So you can see the level of disparity we have in our health sector. And this is what happens when you have situations like that. And health is such an interesting sector because it isn't a, a need. So if you're not banked, you will find other ways to get services, right? But if you need health care, you're going to have to find that health care. So it's one of those uh, central, essential sectors that a, con that a country or a continent will need to even develop at all. So um, as he was talking about tourism and, 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 and how Africans spend a lot of money uh, um, outside of Africa, I, I quickly searched and I found out that um, Nigerians alone spend about one billion in health tourism every single year. So we find one billion dollars and we take it out. Forty-seven percent of that one billion goes to India. So we travel to India and we take our money, our hard-hand forex, and take it to India to access healthcare. So what we're doing at Life Bank, and the reason why you have that situation is we aren't thinking about innovative ways. Of, so we don't have the 4.5 billion that I mentioned. Nigeria doesn't have that money right now to just read into the health sector. Um, so we need in this particular sector to think about innovative ways of leapfrogging the money that we do not have. And that's where technology comes in. So at Life Bank, the company that I have the pleasure of running, what we're doing is deploying innovation so that that one doctor for that 5,000 people can do more, faster, safer, and cheaper for those 5,000 people. Because if we focus on um, finding 4.5 billion, it's not going to happen. So what we're doing at Life Bank is helping health, health providers and health supply, um, health providers find the supply they need faster, cheaper, and safer. And we're deploying data, we're de deploying um, automated intelligence to figure out what providers need for their patients and how we can get it to them quickly uh, and efficiently. Lekon, can you give us uh, your own scope on what, you know, where we are, how fast we're moving from your perspective? All right, thanks. Um, I mean, what I do on a daily basis is, you know, trying to find my manpower for, you know, for companies in Africa. And I can clearly say that uh, I'm not sure we're moving at all. I have tons of roles on a monthly basis, and more often than not, I find it extremely hard to fill those roles. In terms of the skills, right, more skills are imported into the country in terms of um, professionals than the actual um, guys on ground. In terms of the experienced guys on ground, more and more on a daily basis are they leaving the country. So either go to Canada or go to the US, you know, um, relocating their families and whatnot. So, in terms of skills growth, the answer is we're moving backwards, actually. In terms of education, I mean, we all know, right? Why results, you know, failure rates, um, the infrastructure is not there. We're not building the manpower for the future. So every day, we, you realize that you find it increasingly harder to fill a role. And what do you do? You have to import manpower. So are we moving in? Are we moving? Are we growing from a manpower perspective? The answer is no. Are we tapping the strata of manpower that we have? The unskilled, the semi-skilled, the extremely skilled, 
The answer is no. If you're not extremely skilled, then you're most likely unskilled. Innovation in the Nigerian sector, and, or in, in the technology sector in Nigeria, and also whether it's moving forward or not. So this morning, actually, we just had 30 visiting investors uh, leave Nigeria who were here for the last five days um, exploring the tech ecosystem and looking for investment opportunities. And we have had an increase in the number of attendees. So, so what I do is I provi we provide curated market access for foreign investors looking to uh, invest in or support the technology ecosystem in Nigeria. We started in 2015 with groups of five to ten, and now we see investors from ranging from Rockefeller or Midyar across the board looking to enter the technology space and explore uh, the investment opportunities here in Nigeria. Um, we've also seen in 2015 alone, there was about $150 million invested into the venture capital and technology space in West Africa. Um, in 2016, in Q1, there was already double that from the Goldman Sachs investment across the board. <laughs> I know you, you mentioned your, your problem with <laughs> those, the Goldman Sachs in Nigeria. But, um, so across the board, as I, I, I see growth. I see incredible growth. Um, we have, what, 106% mobile penetration, 650 million mobile users, more than the U.S. and U.K. combined. Uh, as far as the number of investable opportunities here in Nigeria, there were maybe five, maybe six, 2015, eight, nine, and 2016. Now we have, what, 10, 15, 20 going to international incubators, receiving investment from um, Nigerian active angels and venture capitalists, as well as, as foreign investors. Um, we see more and more liquidity opportunities from the Jobberman acquisition, Deal Day, um, um, Iroko TV talking about the 3,000% the ROI their initial investors have made. So we are seeing incredible growth in the technology sector. Okay, thanks. So obviously there's a lot happening. Um, Afra, what are your thoughts on this uh, new environment that we have in our hands? We have seen technology be an incredible enabler for women who have potentially not had access to market. When we think about what keeps people from getting a job or starting their own business, typically it is access to networks, to knowing the right people. It is access to finance so that you can source your goods and your materials. And it's the skills in order to actually run a sustainable business. So at She Leads Africa, our goal is to provide all of those opportunities via a digital platform. And while many people may see social media, for example, as a way to play and to waste time, there are many entrepreneurs who are using social media to acquire skills, learning lessons, learning business skills on YouTube, to run mobile-only businesses through Facebook, through Instagram, and to utilize payment, online payment services to have those transactions so that they don't have to go to a bank and such. So for us, we see that it's opening access to markets and enabling people to communicate across borders, across locations. But there's still work to be done, of course, around access to data and the price of data so that more people have access to affordable internet services and then also payment platforms. Being able to actually pay for goods and services not just in Nigeria. How do you get payments from South Africa? And not, you know, a bank can take care of, you know, maybe 100,000, 200,000 Naira, but what if someone just wanted to spend 15,000 Naira and the fee to even do that foreign transaction is worth the total purchase price? And so making it easier for small scale entrepreneurs running online only businesses or small SMEs to be able to do business across borders and across locations, I think that is the next great opportunity for technology to make it easier for more women to have access to markets. Okay, thanks. Jo Joel, I want to come to you. Um, you know, we have lots of gaps. We have the knowledge gap. We have the information gap. We also have the poverty and wealth gap. Of course, you've talked about the infrastructure gap. What do we need to do in the next five to 10 years? How can we get a railway line between Calabar and Accra, for example? And what do we need to do to do that? What's stopping us? Joel. Let me give you a case study. South Africa has 50 million people, and they have 50 million installed megawatts. And they are installing another 30 to make it 80. 
sorry, 80,000. Nigeria has 10,000 installed, which were privatized, and they're battling to deliver 4,000 megawatts of the 10. And then there is another 30,000 megawatts, which is diesel, fuel, whatever else there is. President Goodluck Jonathan left a 40,000 megawatt goal to deliver power to Nigeria. If I say 10, replace the 30, because the 30, the per kilowatt cost of power ranges between 5 cents and 20 cents, depending where you are buying it in the world. The power in Nigeria, that's diesel and everything, costs between 20 and 40 cents. There's a research report done. Now, if you're going to manufacture something and the cost of power is five times the cost of the person you're competing with, it means your product can never compete. So Nigeria, if they have 10,000 megawatts installed, delivered, then they get another 40,000, they now have 60. God is good to Nigeria. We have 60,000 megawatts. Nigeria has 180 million people. It still requires 120,000 megawatts so that every million Nigerian have got megawatt access to power. If Nigeria does not have 120 to 160,000 megawatts in the next five to 10 years, it will be overtaken by DRC, by Ethiopia, by Angola, and possibly depending on what happens on Egypt and Morocco. You can't manufacture something when the cost is high. Let's look at the other element of the cost. 10 to 15% of the cost of a manufactured good is funding. Now, when you borrow money from the World Bank, 1%, then you say Nigeria. They say Nigeria country risk, 20%. Then, Nigeria inflation. What is inflation? Sorry? 18%. Then, if you come to Nigeria, you have to bring a, 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 an Airbus of expatriates to come and implement the project. What's the cost of the salaries and wages? 20%. You can't produce a car that's produced in Detroit or in Durban, South Africa, in Nigeria, because the cost of doing it in Nigeria Power, you are paying 30% premium. Skill, you are paying 20% premium. Forget that. You now have the power and the skill, the raw material. Are you assembling or are you manufacturing? What's the local content? You don't have the doors, the locks, the window winders, all the things that can be done locally because there is in the industry. So Cost Charis and Toyota, they're just importing kits. Yes, Cosmas Madruga is starting to manufacture the first trailblazer. But it's an assembly plant, it's not a manufacturing plant. Then you go on to the last part, supply chain logistics. Healthcare. Do you know the Africa healthcare industry is ten billion dollars? It can grow to twenty billion by twenty thirty. It's estimated to grow to $50 billion by 2050. But do you know the impediment? The cost of getting the product from the manufacturer to the patient is 60% higher than anywhere else in the world. The reason is that the refrigeration for the injection that Pfizer or whatever require is being paid at 40% electricity generator. So how do you keep the product refrigerated so that when it's used in six months, Pfizer does not have a legal suit? It's impossible. It can't happen. Because the cost of supply chain logistics to go there is expensive. There's a company called Toyota Tusho Japan. I'll close. Toyota Tusho Japan is the company that owns Toyota brand globally. They bought a company called CFAO. Does anybody know CFAO? It's a French company, Peugeot, Renault, whatever. Do you know why they bought it? They didn't buy it for their brands. They bought it because it gives them access to 18 African countries. 
They bought the supply chain logistics. I don't know how many billion. They don't care about Toyota. Now, the problem with Africa is that the infrastructure as it's set up now was set in the colonial regime. It was set to take raw materials out. We have to have the infrastructure that allow Ghana and Benin and whatever to start trading with each other. The big problem is that the people that are making 80% profit, Nigeria is 60 to 70% trading economy. Do you think these people who have made 60 to 70% of the money in the last 20 years will now today want the thing to be given for free? The guy with the diesel company, the generator, they're not interested. Somebody's going to have to make a tough decision. And the only one that can is government. And they will do it for the people. So when you say, what next? What next? It's an African Union problem. Or what next is a, is a Nigeria government problem? What next is a Zimbabwe government problem? Comment Zimbabwe. A lot of people say Robert Mugabe has destroyed the economy. Let me give you five cents of my five cents on Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe is the only SADC economy which is owned, run, managed, controlled by Zimbabweans. 90%. Yes, they used to have an $18 billion economy. It's now sitting at $6 billion. Yes, they used to manufacture all their grain and food. The $6 billion, $2 billion is going to buy maize at import price. No, there's no Zimbabwean that owns land. It belongs to the government. It's a 50-year lease renewed another 50 years. So at the end of the day, Whatever the media says is fine. Whatever they say about him is fine. The reality in Zimbabwe is that Lancaster House, 1978, Lord Soames, Robert Mgabe, James Chikerema, Ebol Muzorewa, Dabaningi Stole, all those leaders, they agreed that 1980 is independence. There was a transition government, Zimbabwe Rhodesia, for two years. 1980, Mugabe won. 1988, he won. Lancaster House Constitution had committed to pay 40 million pounds for any farmer who has a second farm if the government wanted to take it over to pay for the implements. Margaret Thatcher signed, Tony Blair refused to pay. That's the war between Robert Mugabe and Tony Blair. Then the war veteran says, we're going to go back into the bush and the war. Then Mugabe says, I don't have a choice in 1995. I'll pay them out. The gross domestic product of Zimbabwe deficit moved from 3% to 15%. Then Mugabe was supporting Kabila in the war, 1 million US dollars a day, 365 million. World Bank IMF says, we won't give you any loans. You're taking your money and giving it to Kabila. GDP moved to 20%. From then on, exchange rate moved from 15 to 18 to 36 to 90, and then the rest is history. Who in here who has a car, BMW, you earn $100,000, you pay $5,000 a month. You live in a nice suburb, you pay $20,000. Your children go to a private school, you pay $20,000. You pay $40,000 tax. If your salary is taken, your bond is withdrawn, your credit card is taken, your children are taken out of school. Of course, Zimbabwe is bankrupt. It doesn't have credit lines. It's not supported. But they never told the truth. That's the truth of the matter. Britain did not honor $40 million. Yes, the World Bank, Zimbabwe owes $7 billion to World Bank IMF. Zimbabwe needs $7 billion to re-correct the economy. If this was done, Zimbabwe will be restored to where it was in 1995 in less than 36 months. It will become not a $6 billion economy, it will become a $25 billion economy. Joel, you're talking, you're smoking socks. There's a company called Amplatz, which owns a company called Zimplatz. When inflation was 1 million percent, news in the papers, Amplatz put 300 million U.S. dollars to increase platinum export because it was a U.S. dollar export. And they paid back the loan today. Amplatz is listed in... It's economics. It's corporate finance. It's structuring. So you can't have people that can't see the value chain sit in the same room and have a discussion. You can't have the politicians saying we don't talk to bankers. Then you have bankers, they don't talk to agriculture. 
Africans must now learn to sit in the same room to say the problem is a house. If this doesn't happen, we can't resolve it for Nigeria and we can't resolve it for Africa. Thank you. Don't, don't, don't take away that paper. You know, every time you are asked a question, you fill up one page. I mean, you guys should see what he has done in five minutes. It's an entire page from Nigeria to Zimbabwe to South Africa. So it gives me the impression that this is about knowledge, really. This is about literacy. This is about numeric capabilities. This is about not so much blue collar, white collar, but new collar. There's a new paradigm now called white collar. So, so let's situate this innovation thing, business. Let's look at the bottom of the pyramid. And there's the issue of regulation and innovation at the bottom of the pyramid. Afua, you've been around quite a bit. What are your thoughts? How do we galvanize this innovation agenda for those at the bottom of the pyramid? How do you create value for them so that at least we're not just talking about the guys who can drive a BMW or who understand physics and dynamics of economics? One of the companies in our community makes bake mix like Betty Crocker or Duncan Hines, all of the cake mix in Nigeria was imported, and she wanted to create a local alternative using items in the market. She was based in Joss, and she was selling it in a couple of small retailers, but she wanted to expand to Lagos. Um, and in order to do that, the retailer said, you have to have NAFDAQ approval. She goes to talk to NAFDAQ, and they said, well, you need to have a kitchen that has three different rooms, this type of machinery, this type of equipment, and as a small business, just trying to do 100, 150 packs a week, she could not afford it, which means that she could not grow, she could not scale, she was just stuck there in her local environment. And we had a meeting with the Senate President and he asked, what can we do to help entrepreneurs? We said, there are rules and regulations that are designed for people who already have money. You have to have certain resources. You have to be successful enough in order to even pay the paperwork or even to pay for the paperwork or the regulations. Um, and so it seems as if the regulators are not hearing or they're not understanding what it means to actually just be starting out with 10,000 Naira, 15,000 Naira, 20,000 Naira, and using the small capital you have to grow and scale. So I think there's two approaches to the problem. One, as an entrepreneur, you find your way around it. You can choose not to get NAFTAC approval, or you pool your resources. So for this one entrepreneur, we said, who are the other bakers? Or who are the other people who need kitchen resources? What if you all had one central kitchen, and maybe you rented the space out, or you negotiated, and so NAFTAC, you could just get approval for this one venue. And so instead of seeing it as a problem that could stop you, using that entrepreneurial mindset to go around it. And then as entrepreneurs, putting together your issues and bringing them to government. And so it's not just one person here, one person there. Using your power and might and bringing together multiple voices and of course using the media to say, this is the kind of change that we need to see. And if you change this type of regulation, we could go and scale and hire this many more people. But because the messages are spread about and there isn't a coherent story, it's very hard to really see what the issues are and how government can change it. So you're a Ghanaian, right? Yeah. Why did you come to Nigeria? Well, uh, it wasn't on purpose. It wasn't on purpose. I w the company I was working for at the time, I applied for Ghana and they said all the slots were taken. So if I wanted to come here, I had to work in Lagos. My mother said, no, I watched their movies, don't go there. I said, I, said uh, I think it'll be fine. So that was in 2012. And back then, dollar was only 160. So it was a different time when I came here. But um, ultimately, we saw opportunity and really saw scale. And we want to build a company and a platform that's reaching millions and millions of people. It's actually impacting uh, women in business, so we thought this would be the best place to do that. Okay. So really, um, it's, it's, it's been a nice journey so far in Nigeria. And people in Ghana watch Nollywood, 
and decide whether Nigeria is a safe place with plenty of babalawas or not? Yes. She told me to stay away. Okay. Stay away from those people. Okay. So, let me, let me go to Temi. You're in the healthcare business. What's in your work so far, what will you say is a government's appetite for adopting the kind of things you do? Essentially, government's attitude to technology. Um, so, they're not there, as many people know. Uh, there are some governments that are, that will be interested in what we do, and there are some governments that don't even understand um, what we are all about. Um, but the way I think about healthcare in, in, in the, on the continent is, um, especially for Nigeria, that Nigeria can be the healthcare hub for the entire continent. I have an interesting story that I like to tell, and it's really interesting because um, the way most people would think about it is in a negative sense. So when the Ebola crisis happened, um, the first Ebola um, patient in Nigeria, I believe, came to Nigeria because he believed this was the place he could get access to healthcare, right? And I think that's an opportunity instead of um, something bad or something with a negative connotation. It's an opportunity to help heal the African people and to create the healthcare hub in this country that can help us do that. Um, we need um, tech, and the only way we can do that is technology. I don't think that, um, like Ifwa said, I don't think that um, entrepreneurs need to uh, wait for the government. I think the private sector um, is going to be the engine of growth, especially in these particular sectors. And, and, and I am on a one-man mission to basically pitch the idea of private sector delivery of healthcare on the continent. Thank you. Maya, what... What's the ambition? Why do people want to invest in startups in Nigeria? And why should people in New York, for example, uh, come this way with all the negatives that they hear in the media? First, the reason that we are recruiting foreign investors to come to Nigeria and invest <clears throat> in local deals is not because um, we want a bunch of foreign people to own African companies. By all means, Africans should own African businesses. But the problem is, when we first started uh, engaging uh, investors to look at early stage tech opportunities, we found Nigerians would not invest in the tech space. You look at the companies that have been backed locally over you know, $50,000, $100,000, they are inevitably soliciting for foreign investment because of three things. There's, there's nepotism, there's, there's competition, and there's ageism. You're an early stage founder. We talk about all the things that, that Nigerians haven't created. I'm seeing, you know, um, as far as drone security created by somebody under 30 year, years old in, here in Nigeria, I'm seeing a, a light version of a competitor to Chrome and Firefox made by a 13 and a 15 year old here in Nigeria. Nigeria. I'm seeing incredible innovations in the fintech, in the agritech, digitization of health records in the, in the healthcare sector. But the problem is these people are not supported by, by local Nigerian investors. Um, um, we, we, we're pushing products and it's like, oh, who are you? Who, who is your family? Who do you know? How old are you? And their ideas are automatically discredited. So that is, that is why um, we are engaging foreign investors. And so, so as far as, as the hindrances that technology companies are facing in Nigeria, it is here. It is local. And we need to keep pushing and changing the perception of, of what it means to be an innovator and what it means to be supported. And also the other issue is lack of access to capital. So one, local Nigerians aren't investing in local deals, but also you go to get a loan an entrepreneur goes to get a loan with a fantastic idea that's wildly scalable, 25% interest rates on a loan, and you need to have three years, of an, three years of audits, and you only have a business for one year. So thinking of innovations and, and, and tech startup and entrepreneur startup and, and friendly, or entrepreneur and, and tech friendly policies that, that can support and promote innovation. As far as why foreign investors are looking and so excited increasingly in, in Nigeria, why you know Mark Zuckerberg has made an investment recently and, uh, and all of these Silicon Valley based VCs are, are coming over to the continent. Um, one, it's because 
If you are a successful entrepreneur in Nigeria, you are literally pioneering an industry and you have not just 200 million people that you can cater to, you have a billion, over a billion people on the continent. So just the sheer opportunity of pioneering industries, whereas, I mean, FinTech is hacked in the US. You know, uh, agriculture technology is hacked in the US. But if you can change that here, if you can solve that problem here, there's 100x, 500x return possibility. The other, the other reason is because um, low competition. So you're looking at early stage tech deals here, and you have the same company, same revenue, same traction here versus in Silicon Valley. Because capital is, is so, there's an oversupply of capital in, in Silicon Valley, there's a competition for deals. And so there's incredibly inflated valuations. And you come here and you see the same opportunity for one fourth the cost that you would there. So it's just more bang for your buck. And also, People think it's cool. I mean, to be a part of, of these of building industries, of changing the way the continent sees innovation and building sectors in Nigeria. That's one of the main reasons why. Thank you. Lekon, I wanted to address that. You used to be a startup. I'm not sure Jogoman is still considered a startup. And you operate not just within Nigeria, but across Africa yes. by default. Now, before you answer that, I'd like you guys to remember, see our keynote speaker, he's still writing, <laughs> even though he's not being spoken to. So that tells you a brain at work. So, Lekon, yes. your thoughts on growing a business from zero to, to uh, a multi-market player in Africa, your challenges, your disappointments, and what people trying to follow your path should look out for. Thank you. Um, so basically when you start um, a business, most especially when you're small, you know, uh, Maya talked about the age thing. It's, it's quite tough for you to get support. It's quite tough, tough for you to get funding um, and to be frank also from local investors. Um, you get lucky, I guess, you know, in, talking about Jogoman um, in 2009, I'd say we got lucky um, by, you know, a guy called, uh, you know, a guy called Chikan will be, you know, looking at us and saying, you know what, I want to put in some cash into, into this business. Now, so for the average small business, right, there's the problem of validation, there's the problem of you getting support, and you have to crack that. That's one. Number two is the infrastructure, the community. So what happens when you're trying to set up something and there is no community to, to, to go to, right? You have to do your finance yourself. Um, certainly you don't have money to hire an accountant, so you have to just kind of create an Excel sheet somewhere. Or you're trying to create, um, you know, maybe create a fancy, um, you know, bottled water or something. And at the same time, you can't find the right factory that would, you know, produce maybe 100 copies or 500 copies, and the minimum you'd get is 5,000 copies. And what that tells you is that there is no community to drive you to that next level. So what do you do? What did we do at our own end? We focused basically, basically on the key performance indicators. So we asked ourselves, what is the next stage? What exactly do we want to achieve? We want to attract funding, right? What do we need to do to attract funding? In jobs business, online jobs business, it's pretty simple, right? The, the, you have to have um, the number of jobs on your platform, the number of candidates on your platform, and how many roles you fill per time. We kind of focused on that. We were burning a lot of cash. Um, well, in that day, it wasn't that much cash um, as compared to, uh, you know, so maybe the transaction size that we do now, um, you know, but we're focused and, you know, just to tell a little bit of the story, we were noticed. At that time, you, you know, you, you, um, the, the, econo the community, the startup community has not matured up to this point where you have a lot of PE guys and, you know, investors flying in to look for deals. You only had one, two, three. I think the only investment that we had then within the internet space before us was Wakanao. And it was the same investor that invested in Wakanao, that invested in Jobberman, and invested in Iroko. So this was an investor that came in all the way from New York, flew in, knew, well, maybe knew one or two people, but found Jobberman on the internet just by research and sent an email through 
one of you know our competitors i'd say you know linkedin to say i want to talk to you um Lekon. we like what you're doing would you be happy to meet with us at that time it was still we're still trying very hard to convince the local investors that we are not yahoo yahoo boys <laughs> the guy flew in asked a couple of questions looked at our numbers looked at our books at that meeting the guy said you know what i'm going to put a million dollars into this business at that time we were still begging other investors local investors one other thing that we did is partnerships i think partnerships is extremely key when you're small right you need a big partner to put a stamp of approval a stamp of authenticity on you and which company did that to us was mtn so we had an, a partnership with mtn to say you know what would we'll feed our jobs to you then you can you know at that time all the mtn ads and whatnot was not paid a cover by jobberman it was purely mtn paying for those ads and we're having our revenue share i think technically that opened up a lot for us now we're on the internet the platform the distribution network is the internet right the the hand the, the device of um, the user is our hand um, end, end device but when it comes to things like water like you know hardware what is it it's a distribution most startups most small companies lack access to distribution and it falls back to infrastructure yes some few weeks ago you know we had a train move tomato from the north to, to you know to the south and we're very happy i mean if we had had that probably a lot of rotten tomatoes in the north would have found its way down to lagos these tiny companies would have become mid you know small at, at at now as at now would have become medium and would have been able to hire the right skill sets you know the you know like uh, um Joel, you know hire Joel, you know to to help advise on how to grow so these are some of the things that we did you know and we partnered we focused on the things that would make us attractive to an investor right and we leveraged on the distribution network which was the internet that we had thank you okay thank you so yours is a success story i'm sure other firms have continued in your path uh let me bring mr jim hander back to lagos um mr joe without without a doubt china has an influence on what's going on in africa they're in construction they're in commerce they're in technology even the american companies that are in africa manufacture in china by default how should we engage the new colonialists have they been called they've been called that that china represents what should be our agenda for engaging china okay china china is a very 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 difficult trading partner for africa china bailed out america in 2009-10 when america nationalized all their banks and the insurance companies while america was telling africa to privatized so china has a balance sheet let me explain i'll give an, a nigerian example in abuja there was a tender that was done to put cctv camera the tender in abuja i have a client that put a tender for 150 to 170 million dollars this was german technology state of the art technology to execute the tender was done and it was won by someone and it was delivered at 450 or 475 million dollars when the boko haram something happened somebody then said let's go and look at the camera to see why it happened there was no database the camera was not working there was no after sales service to support it so that deal the way it was structured it's structured in our world of investment banking 
where 40 to 60 percent of the deal is funded and it comes out as interest. So when the Chinese come and say we'll bring everything, they're taking out 80 percent of the value. But they don't leave you with the knowledge and the after sales service. Now, the worst partner you can have in Africa is the Chinese. You say, but Joe, how can you say that about the Chinese? I'll give you an example, a specific deal. Standard Bank. Standard Bank today is owned 20% by ICBC. You know that, the Chinese, Chinese bank? It owns Standard Bank of South Africa, 20%. Do you know today, EcoBank, 20% is owned by NetBank. Okay, EcoBank, the Nigeria EcoBank Transnational, is owned by NetBank. The deal that was done by Standard Bank, for them to take 20% of Standard Bank, the deal was done six to eight weeks. When the Chinese come, they come with an attorney, they come with an engineer, they come with a branding specialist, they come with the regulator, they come with the permanent secretary in the ministry. They come with a state-owned enterprise that's going to do the technology. They come with China Exim Bank. You never see one or two Chinese people come. They come, all of them. <laughs> they come, negotiate, and close the deal in three, four, six, eight weeks. How can we as Africans compete with the Chinese when they're sending their best to come and negotiate things. China only wants raw materials from Africa. So when China comes to Nigeria, they are not looking to put a refinery. They want to take your crude oil. When China comes to Nigeria, they are not coming to put a processing plant for your agriculture. They just want to get the land. This is a fact again, then I stop talking. The best arable land in the world is on the equatorial belt. The best arable land in the world is on the equatorial belt. Go and check out China, Cargill, Bangi, Louis Dreyfus, DuPont. Go and find out who has bought all the land between Nigeria, Ghana, all the way. Go and find out who owns the land. They have already bought your land as agriculture land where there is water while we're busy fighting about the Delta, the Port Harcourt, whatever. When they start manufacturing their products, there's four companies that control agriculture in the whole world. They are called A, B, C, D. The first one is Arthur Midlands. The second one is called Bangi. The third one is called Cargill. The fourth one is called Louis Dreyfus. I was the finance director for Cargill for five years when they set up their business in Africa. The level of transfer pricing that happens, you know when they talk about those hybrid seeds, etc. Cargill is a 125 billion dollar company that makes seven billion dollars profit a year and they double their profit every five years. So Cargill can go and give Robert Mugabe seven billion dollars and settle his debt in one year's profit. Cargill can go and give Robert Mugabe seven billion dollars and pay his debt. There is a company in Europe called Cargill Financial Services. Standard Chartered the bank borrows from Cargill to finance their banking business in Africa. Now, people are talking about, uh, we want to prove to the investor, I've explained to you, if your cost structure cannot compete on a global platform, everything else you are doing, you can't compete. And I've explained to you, our cost structure as Africa can't compete. And I've said, the only way we can change this is we have our leaders agree that we're going to work together. Do you know Bill Gates? Bill Gates was worth $60 billion. He gave away 30. 
Warren Buffett gave away 30. And then, did you check out recently? Bill Gates is worth $90 billion. Do you know, do you know where my, where, what Bill Gates owns today? Bill Gates bought a company called Monsanto. Do you know what Monsanto is? Monsanto is the company that bought the businesses of Cargill in Africa. It's a germplasm genetics hybrid. Monsanto is the company that controls food and agriculture. Bill Gates is no longer in the technology industry. He's in food. All the things Bill Gates is doing on helping Africa, on HIV, AIDS, whatever, they're getting information, they're finding out. They'll then come with the products in Monsanto. They'll then come and sell it. They have bought the land already. Bill Gates, he owns a company. Go and Google, Monsanto. Monsanto, it's a germplasm business. It's the genetics. The genetics in agriculture is the same in healthcare as the, 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 the prescription drug. You're given 20 years to hold the IP. Then it becomes genetic. Africa can't compete with America until Africans use the land in Africa for producing the food in Africa and have excess food in Africa to export, not as green vegetables, but packaged export products. Why does ShopRite checkers come to Nigeria and bring things from anywhere in the world? Why did Woolworths go bankrupt in Nigeria? They were importing things. Who are buying? Nigerians. So is vegetables in Nigeria the same as vegetables in Kenya, the same as vegetables in South Africa? Yes. Why can't you buy a green soup or, or, or fair or whatever? They don't want it because they don't know the product. So food lovers market, who defines the product? It has to be Nigerians. Guys, if, what I'm telling you, this is the Bible in investment banking. If investment banking, this is how it is. If you are in retail banking, you're a baby. Then when you're in commercial banking, you're a boy. Then when you are merchant banking, you're a, you're a man. Then when you're investment banking, you're a a senior, Oga, 50 years. And then, when you're 80 years old, it's called private equity. These are things that are done without talking to anyone. These are people that will start the entire value chain. So if you are in real estate, Bodea De Digi, you have the change of land use from agriculture, you have the services, water, reticulation, sewer, services, electricity, water connection, then the piece of ground is worth something, then you have a title deed. Then you construct your building. Are you building a $10,000 million, $10, house, affordable, $30,000 house, affordable, or in Banana Island, $1 million house, affordable? The superstructure, the bricks and the rough finish is exactly the same price. The difference between $500,000 and $200,000 is the tiles from Italy and Germany. It's the same building. It's the same cement. Then, when you want to sell the house now, if a guy can buy a $1 million house, why would they come and buy your $1 million house? They'll build another one and another one and another one. The only one who buys a house that has been built by someone is a banker who earns $5,000 a month, who has paid rent. This is the only place in the world where you pay rent for 12 months or 24 months. Never heard of it. <laughs> How do you pay rent for 12 months and you can't afford to buy a house? In a normal economy, 25% of your salary goes to pay a bond. In South Africa, 30% of their salary they use in transport. Every South African should have a house. But because there's no transport system that works, they spend 30% of their money on transport. So in Nigeria, if you can pay one-year rent, and then you've been paying one-year rent for the past five years because you worked in the bank, why can't you get a bond for 10 years? I don't understand it. <laughs> Thank you. I don't think I understand it either. 
Mr. Chimanda, I'm sure you know that most people will agree with me that most of us want to be big boys on Banana Island. And I think that's the challenge, that's the problem. This quest for something that you may never get. So we need to wrap up. We have about five to six minutes. And I will allow each of our distinguished panelists to give us their thoughts on the new media agenda. We should have an agenda for the media because it all begins with information and propaganda. Uh, and I use propaganda very respectfully. Lekon, let me start with you. What role should our media enterprise play in changing the narrative for Africa? Thank you. I think um, quickly one would realize that you know, most of the very, would I say sensational news or the real news is heard from, um, you know, the foreign media. So, for example, when um, Abacha died and, you know, so many other um, examples, we got to hear from BBC, CNN before, you know, the local news picked it up. I think that for new media, we have to figure out a way of um, being more investigative. That is one. Number two, yes, we want to make money. Right. You know, someone tweeted recently and said um, that when you look at most of the new, um, the digital websites, you know, the, um, the online, um, you know, um, news, news as it were, you'd realize that, you know, they push more of sex, you know, or um, sexually inclined, um, you know, materials. Why? Because they want more clicks and they want more Google revenue and whatnot. Right. I think it's time that we begin to push the right information, the information that actually sets Nigeria and Africa, you know, in the right tone and not negative news, news that, you know, would uh, fetch just money and, um, you know, to the detriment of the continent. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Maya, your thoughts? First, I think we need to stop with the ideal, 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 or idolization, excuse me, idolization of Western culture. I go home um, and see my sisters at Unileg watching BET, uh, MTV, um, all of these, you know, music videos, this, that, and the other, and coming up with the themes. And my younger brother, who just graduated from high school here, uh, his, 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 just the idolization of Western culture is bringing concerning morals to Nigerian youth. So I think promotion of a lot of the success stories that we have here in Nigeria, we don't need to watch the success stories of foreign, foreign businesses and foreign um, celebrities. We have all of that here. Um, I think secondly and most importantly, we need to, we need to focus on um, we need to focus on the promotion of our of our youth. Um, we need there in young populations. I, I find in, in hiring and recruiting talent for the startups that we work with, um, there is this memorization and regurgitation mentality. Seeing this, responding this, and and producing this. We need to promote critical analysis. We need to promote education through the airwaves. Uh. Thank you, Timmy. Can you talk a bit about fake news? How has this affected you and your thoughts in a nutshell? Um, I think that um, fake news, especially in Africa, it's, um, it's a growing problem, right? It's a problem that we haven't tackled, and it's a problem that's been here uh, for a very long time. I think the media has a responsibility to um, inform the African people in the right way um, I think there needs to be a sustainable business model for the media where uh, the media is not consistently um, passing out misinformation just so they can sustain their business. And I think a lot of the times what drives that is, you know, you want to get views out, you want to, you know, get a lot of things out. But I think that we need to start solving real problems um, across sectors, so not just media, but um, across health and education and manufacturing and investment um, on the continent and, and focus on the problem and look for uh, smart solutions to sort of um, solve the problem as well as leapfrog the investment we don't have. Thank you. Afra, what should be the next step for our film and movie and music industry? I think that these um, offer an incredible opportunity 
to create and tell different types of stories. Right? There are some things that we have seen over and over again. Right? But the individuals who are going to win in the film houses who are going to be successful are those who can tell a story that cuts across. I actually was in a business meeting in Kenya and waiting in the lobby and I saw Nollywood, you know, streaming there. And you go to a hair salon in Dolphin Estate and there's Indian movies. Right? So there are stories that can translate across markets, across locations, but it requires us to think differently, to come up with compelling stories that are authentic to us, but also resonate. Everyone cares about heartbreak. Everyone cares about family. Everyone cares about faith. So how can we tell those stories in an authentic way? And then make sure, of course, the business metrics make sense and that we're creating something that sustains an industry and creates opportunities for others to enter as well. Thank you. I'd like Mr. Chimhanda to have the final word. And uh, I, I noticed uh, that you haven't mentioned the recently elected president of the USA in your comments. <laughs> and I realize that some of the things you're saying kind of will sound like coming out of Mr. Trump's own fact sheets. You, you've talked about the need for Africa, the need for countries to have an agenda, to be somewhat protectionist in the things they do, nationalism and all of that. What are your thoughts uh, as you wrap up for us on how the guys in Limpopo should link up with the guys in Lagos and we can drive this agenda forward in five to ten years? I'll first talk about, I'll last talk about Donald Trump, who is a great, who is a great, who is a great American president. I'll relate to Donald Trump and compare him to J.F. Kennedy. And my worry is that Donald Trump might be taken out in the next year or two. And I'm going to relate Donald Trump to Martin Luther King, who was taken out. I'll relate Donald Trump to Chris Honey, who was taken out. But let's come back to brand, the question of brand. I explained to you that there are, life is six levels. The first level is the land, which is used for agriculture or as mineral resources or as a store of wealth. In investment banking or investment management 101, when a person has enough money, 30% of their money is in equities. 30% of their money is in debt instruments. 30% of their money is in real estate. And 10% of their money is in cash and near cash items. A guy with real money, that's what happens. They then decide which part of real estate, which part of the world. They then decide whether it's a listed company, a bond, a country bond, a junk bond, etc. So I park that. When you own the land, you then go on to the next thing. I said it's the politics. One man, one vote. But one man, one vote uninformed is a disaster. You go on to the next level. You are not supposed to gather. If you gather, you'll be arrested. You are now controlled. That's the police. Then you go one level. No, the police beat you up. You were not supposed to be beaten up. That's the magistrate. Then there is the court. Then there is the high court. Then there is the Supreme Court then there is the constitutional court, different levels of courts to get an answer to somebody who didn't do what they were supposed to do. The gatekeeper of what happens on the land, the politics, and the law is media. This is where BBC is. This is where CNN is. This is where Al Jazeera is. By the way, this is where DSTV is. And the good news for you, uh, Bodea Dedeji introduced me to John Momo. This is where Channel TV is. John Momo. He runs one of the finest uh, TV companies in the continent. Why do I say that? When you walk into a Nigeria hotel and you tune into Channel TV, it's a Nigerian lawyer talking to a Nigerian banker, talking to a Nigerian politician, talking to a Nigeria industrialist, talking to, and the five of them are fighting about something. And each one of them, they know what they are talking about. And they are agreeing to disagree, and then they go away. If you go on CNN, 
it's a person that's hybrid about what happens in Africa, hybrid about what you should say about America, hybrid about where China fits in the thing, hybrid about Africans and the African problem, hybrid. Listen, these people are unintelligent, so I don't listen to CNN. I don't listen to BBC. I listen to Al Jazeera sometimes. I love Channel TV. Why? I want somebody to give me information and I decide for myself. I don't want to be spoon-fed. I don't want to be given information that's pre-prepared. So the missing link is media. Now, let's go one level up. When you go onto the next floor, that's economics. If people know what to decide, they can then do private equity. They can then do social media. They can then do healthcare. Because people now know. I, and my passion is to help people. How can you have a passion to do something that can never be funded? How can you study an MBA in something that you can never get a job? That's why Africans, they do a degree, they do a master's, they do an, a PhD, they do a second PhD, and a third PhD. <laughs> this is an African problem. And then they can't be employed because 90% of what they learned in the degree, the honors, the master's, the PhD, and in the double PhD can't be used in the job. Now, you now need to go on to the top floor. That's called sustainable living. Now, closing remark, Donald Trump. <laughs> Donald Trump has been liquidated five or six times. Donald Trump recreated himself. Donald Trump created, you know, in Marina here, Marina, where no one wants to build there. I don't know what in Johannesburg it's called, uh, uh, Alex. He went and he recreated civilization in a part of New York that was disused. But this was over 30 years. When people talk about the Donald Trump towers today, he bought that piece of ground 30 years ago. Why do people have a problem with Donald Trump? Because Donald Trump gives his view. Now, he's the first American president that gives his view. Okay, do I agree with Donald Trump? Sometimes he's nuts, because the things he says should not be said. But at least he is saying what he thinks. And he is giving you what he's honest. The worst people in the world are the British. The British will sit and have coffee with you, high tea, and agree you're doing a deal. As soon as he walks away from you, he says he's an idiot, he was smelling, he puts perfume in the room. I'd rather deal with a person, an Africana. You know, in South Africa, there's Africaners. An Africana will walk in the room and say, I don't like you, and he walks out. An Africana will walk in the room and say, do you know what you're talking about? He listens to you, listens to you, and he says, you're talking crap. An Africana will walk in the room and listens to you, and listens to you, and he says, okay, you're making sense. How are we going to work together? He'll give you 30% of the company. He keeps 30% of the company. He says, find the person to do 40% of the company. These are genuine people. Forget the color. I'd rather deal with an enemy that I know where I stand than a person that says one thing in front of me and another thing behind me. I'm no longer in the, I'm no longer in the African business. I'm not black. A black man is not my brother. The biggest money I've lost in the past five years, my first company liquidation, my second company liquidation, and the last time here in Nigeria was my black brother. Brother, brother, brother. <laughs> they say something in your face, and they do something behind you. So the only person I agree with is values. And there's only three values. Integrity, honesty, transparency. That's it. If he's white, if he's yellow, if he's orange, as long as he's got integrity, say what he says, does what he does. If he's honest, if he says, listen, I had given you 30%, actually you deserve 40, I'm sorry. He's honest. We're correcting it. Now, the top draw, 600 million Africans live on less than $1 a day. 400 million Africans are women, unempowered. All us husbands, 
We will go with our wives. We think they should be in the kitchen. Our daughters. I have four kids. Two of my daughters, cum laude, first class degree in politics, philosophy, economics, and law. The other one in architecture. Golden key. Top 10% at South Africa top five universities. My first son dropped out of law in the second year. My last boy refused to go to university. My last boy, my first son was a millionaire at 23, and he lost everything. My last boy is running a business with two Jewish friends. He drives a Porsche Boxster convertible, and he dates a Jewish girl, and he goes to Israel and Bangladesh. They're entrepreneurs. They don't look at color. They deal with the person according to. But my daughters have produced the goods of private school. Now, Africa, what do our president want? What do our governors want? They can't want to tell us to create jobs and say I own 30% of it. They can say the state government of Lagos owns 50% of it for the people of Lagos to put roads, dams, and whatever. When the money comes, the trust is put there, the governor is there, six people are trustees. He, as the person that does the deal, takes 10% and he puts his daughter or his uncle or his whatever. Everybody has to be paid. When the white people say there is corruption, no, 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 no. Somebody got paid. The World Bank did a report. This is my last comment, and I can show you the report. The World Bank did a report. Of every $100 that are paid on an African project, $70 goes out of the country. $20 is given to the facilitator. That's $90. $5 is given to the big carriers. And 5% stays on the continent. The 20% that gives to the facilitators is the politicians. The 5% that gives to the facilitators is Biz Magrewane, Joel Chimanda, Bodea Dedigi. It's the professional who really knows, who puts the deal on the table. How can less than 10% value stay on the continent when a deal has been done? It's called transfer pricing. President Mbeke has done the report. Illicit funds transfer Africa Union $50 billion dollars leaves Africa, Pfizer, Cargill, Standard Chartered, all the multinational corporations, all the ones that have no corruption. Go and check out the report. $50 billion every year goes out of the continent. It's a fact. And yet they come and talk to us about corruption and they call it lobby. We should refuse as Africans. We should just refuse. So I've reached the point where I've refused. I refuse to work with a white person who doesn't respect me as an equal, I totally refuse. If you say to me, but Joel, you're not a millionaire. I don't care about being a millionaire. I lost my money three times. I'd rather be me and die as me than me to be worth $100 million and I, have, I, I am, a, a, what do you call it, a puppet, somebody telling me what to do. But if I do what I'm doing now, which is what I'm doing, I will be there with Aliko Dangote. It's not possible. It's not possible to do the right thing and bank the unbanked 200 million people who nobody is servicing, and you charge them two cents, two cents, it, it can't happen. You will become a billionaire if you pro solve a problem. Facebook, Skype, WhatsApp, telecommunications, cement, banking, and everything else. So that's my comment. Thank you very much. There is nothing much more to say, but to thank our panelists for defining what the new narrative for Africa should be. I'd like also to give them another round of applause. Indeed, we've had a good time today. I'm sure we all agree with me. We've had a good time. And in summary, the bottom line is, let's all begin to solve problems. Thank you. All right, we'll take questions at this point. If I ask my question, like um, Joel said, about the education system in Nigeria, um, basically, I think that 
education system is not supposed to be the way it is presently. You know, I was reading something a few weeks back, and it said um, outside the country in foreign schools, they teach um, the students how to make texts and all of that. And in a Nigerian school, you teach them how to label cockroaches. And then um, I discovered that, like Joel said, you don't use 80% of what you learn in school outside. So can a system be made whereby people are just, or rather youths or young people, people that, are, that want to learn, can just go somewhere where they will just learn? And you don't have to carry all of the books about. Because basically, somehow I feel it is useless. Sorry to say. But that's the way I see it. I don't know. Thank you. All right. My name is Osho Holanawa Johantoni. And I have a very simple question um, to be directed to uh, Mr. Joel Chimhanda. Um, as a finance expert, sir, I want to put it to you. Because I, I want to believe most, you know, majority of the problem young entrepreneurs in Nigeria have uh, is um, trying to get up, um, you know, get, you know, start with um, finance. Sir, I want to ask you so that as an entrepreneur, how can you attract an investor either locally or internationally? And then secondly, I want to also ask you that, um, uh, you know, as a business owner, either locally or internationally, there are so many challenges which are actually before you. Number one is, uh, you know, government policies which are not even favorable at all. The business environment is not favorable. How do you think um, we can actually come up, you know, with solutions that will help us to overcome these government policies and get finances for startup projects? Thank you very much, sir. Okay, that will be all for now. We'll take responses from the panel. I'm going to answer your question in a different way. Okay. If a, if a woman is going to give birth to a child in China, or in Nigeria, or in Russia, or in India, or in America. What is the special thing that must happen when a woman is in labor delivering a child? There needs to be a midwife, or there needs to be a nurse, or there needs to be a doctor. Now, entrepreneurialism is not something that you make. Entrepreneurs are made. So when President Buhari is the president of Nigeria 20 years after he was a general and president and he lives in a village in a five-bedroomed house, his whole life is politics. Don't come today when he's 80 and think you can be like him because his entire life vision was to be that. Now, when we say what we've said today, there's a lady here talking about private equity. That's a midwife. There's a gentleman there talking about a successful business. He's a father with a child that was born. There's a lady here talking about healthcare industry. There's no shortage of people who, if you have a good idea, you ought to go to and get the support. There's no emotion around running a business. You are either an entrepreneur or you are not. Don't, you, don't imagine you are something that you are not. If you want to be a wife, you come home at 6. You go to church on Sunday. If you want to be a wife, you don't go to a nightclub. You don't sleep with seven guys. It's a choice. So if you want to be a businessman, why do you want to be a businessman when you don't know what it is and what it takes to be business? A conference cannot produce a businessman. If you are a rich man and you have 16 girlfriends, then you don't have a wife. Fine, you can have 30 girlfriends. If you want to be a family man, that's a different thing altogether. We all have to make the choices of what we want to be. My parting remark, if I say the word Nike, what do we think of? If I say Mother Teresa, what do we think of? If I say Nelson Mandela, what do we think of? If I say Tiger Woods, what do we think of? If I say Nigeria, what do we think of? Okay. There's nothing about Nigeria that's Nigerian 
that you mention the name, everybody thinks about Nigeria. You will have to be something that's that thing. If you say Zimbabwe, a president that took the land from the white people, everybody's unhappy. Wherever he goes in the world, everybody's fighting him. He's in power for 33 years. What about Nigeria? Thank you. I... And, and I love President Mugabe. I was asked a question, if you had one hour, who is the three people you would want to meet with? Nelson Mandela, Robert Mugabe, or Barack Obama? I said, Robert Mugabe. And the guy said to me, it doesn't make sense. Why would you want to do that? I said, I want to understand why he allowed the economy go to where it went. A person of such intellect. I want to know the reason. There was a reason. And as a Zimbabwean, I owe it to myself to know the reason. Yes, I could be with Barack Obama. What do I care? He makes no difference in my life. So you as a Nigerian, what drives you? Are you proudly Nigerian? So the person who's saying, we want to do business in this, a person that does business is already doing it. If you want to learn to do business now, the next 10 years, decide what you want to do. Research, living without food, no nightclub, no makeup, study, go to school. You have to learn it. You can't be a businessman when you don't have a skill. Why would I give you money to run a mobile company when MTN, Glossel, it is a lot, give me a 40% return on investment because you've woken up this morning and thinking I'll give a phone to everybody without a bank account. No, sir. Can't happen. Thank you very much. Can't happen. Thank you. Once again, I'd like to thank our panelists for this panel. It's been very interesting, very enthralling, and I, I'd like you all to join me in thanking them once again for the session. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for all our panelists. The keynote speaker, founder, J.S. Capital South Africa, Joel Chimhanda, founder and CEO, Ingressive, Maya Organ Famodu, Senior Vice President, Jobberman Olali Konludi, co-founder, she leads Africa, if I will say, and of course, the founder of Live Bank, Temi Giwa Tsubosun, and of course, the external relations leader, IBM Central and West Africa, Muiwa Muile. Round of applause for all of them. All right, we have plaques for all of our speakers. And of course, at this point, I would like to invite her, give the plaques to our speakers, the group director, marketing and business development, Verdant Silver. Round of applause for Inkiru Ogwadimma. I invite to the stage Mrs. Biola Sani a member of the Verdanzil Board of Directors uh, to actually present and appreciate uh, our speakers for today. To Joel Chinghanda, founder of JC Capital South Africa. The next one goes to Olale Kon Ulude, Senior Vice President, Jobberman. The next one goes to Maya Foundo, Founder and CEO, Ingressive. The next one goes to Afua Osier, co-founder, She Leads Africa. And finally, to Temi Giwa Toboson, founder, Life Bank. Okay, we have one last one to our moderator, Muiwa Mole. Thank you very much. On behalf of the convener and EVC, Dr. Tunji Olubodi, and the board of directors of Verdanzil Group, it is a privilege and a thing of jo great joy to extend a vote of thanks to you all. We appreciate all the time that you have taken out of your busy schedule to be here with us. 
A very big thanks goes to everyone who has contributed to our success as an organization. So far as uh, we have actually been here for the past 10 years, 10 years of hard work and greatness, and we're entirely grateful for all the goodwill. Um, many thanks to everyone, especially everyone's uncle and our very own Uncle Sam. Sir Steve Omojafo, we appreciate you. Thank you very much for coming. Alaji Kankarufi, we thank you so much for coming. Our keynote speaker, Mr. Joel Chimhanda, thank you very much for that enlightening speech. We, we really appreciate that a lot. Um, we wish we had more time because you're quite an interesting uh, speaker to hear from. The panelists, Maya, Ola Lekon, Afua, uh, Temi, our moderator, Muiwa, we appreciate you too much. To the students from Caleb and Covenant University, these lectures are primarily for all of us, but quite interesting for you guys as well. Hope the things you hear here today will shape the way you think and the decisions you will make tomorrow. I would also want to acknowledge the contributions of all the partners and media houses for the great job that they have done for us, especially this period of celebration. Cool FM, Beat FM, Brilia FM, Keith FM City, Niger Info, Y Niger, The Pulse, Business Day, Bella Niger, Vanguard, The Guardian, uh, Apache, Cogito, Media Crush, I, I can't name all of them, but we really, really appreciate you for all the job you have done for us even today. Before concluding, let me also express our sincere gratitude and appreciation to our Executive Vice Chairman, Mr. Tunjo Lubodi. We appreciate you so much. Uh, your leadership and your vision is impeccable. We thank you. Thank you for showing us the way in the past 10 years. And also thank you to the chairman of our EVC, our very own Mrs. B. Tunji Olubode. Thanks for all the support. We want to also thank the chairman, uh, the chairman and board of directors of Verdanzil here, well represented. All the business leaders and wonderful staff of Verdanzil, Nigeria. Shout out wherever you are. Ghana, Gambia, wherever you are, we appreciate you so much. Thank you to those that I've mentioned, all our media partners here covered. We really appreciate you. The families that are also here seated, our own families, thank you very much. God bless you all and see you in 2018.